Good morning, Central family and friends. Today is Life Word Sunday. No church could reach the nations for Christ alone. We partner with Life Word to help reach the unsaved people groups of the world. Today, we ask you to pray for our partner in ministry and we salute Life Word for their faithfulness to spread the gospel. Pray for our pastors this week as they attend the Arkansas Baptist State Convention annual meeting. Be in prayer for them as they represent our church and for the decisions that will be made this week. Our students will be leaving for fall retreat this Friday at 6 p.m. We will meet in front of the student entrance. Please be in prayer for us while we are on this retreat. Sunday, November 7th is Nerf and Nachos. Join us at 4 p.m. for a great time of fellowship for first through fourth grade boys and their dads. We still have some tickets for the David Phelps and Mickey Bell concert. Stop by our Welcome Center today to get your tickets. Drive Through Christmas is our next big event. This is an awesome opportunity to share the story of our Savior with our city and beyond. In 2019, we reached over 2,000 people, and we hope this year to reach even more. You can help us by signing up online at conwaycentralchurch.org slash signups or at Grand Central Station. College and Young Adult Central will be going to Passion January the 2nd through the 4th in Atlanta, Georgia. The cost is $140 per person, and this price goes up after October the 27th. Contact Brother Michael for more information. If you're new to Central, we want to encourage you to fill out a Connect card that's located in the seat back in front of you. Then you can drop it off in a connection box that's located throughout our building. Now join with us as we worship together today at Central. everyone let's stand together the word lord says for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of god welcome to worship bart's going to come and lead us in this song of praise he is jesus messiah let's sing together
Jesus, Jesus the Messiah. He is Lord of all. Let's put our hands together, lift our voice in praise. He is the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, we're going to sing. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. Oh, let's sing it out. You may be seated. I love that song. Our Lord is the line of the tribe of Judah, and he is the holy lamb of God. He's a lion and a lamb. So many things we learn from those portrayals of our Lord in Scripture. So many things that we can gather from him. We are glad you're here with us this morning for worship. We welcome each one of you, those of you who may be joining us by live stream. We hope you'll be involved as well. This is the day the Lord has made, and we need to rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? 
and worship will do so many things for us. And so we're glad that you're here. Brother David did the welcome in the first service and he told us what some of you may already know that our Light the Night event has been postponed for one week till next Sunday afternoon. I believe they're gonna start it now at four o'clock next Sunday afternoon. Just due to the threat of severe weather, he said it's very difficult to chase balloon bounces when the wind gets heavy. And so I thought that was a pretty funny joke and I'd just use it too. So, but y'all pray for Brother David. Uh, we love Brother David, his team that serve us here at Central for the children's ministry. And if you're a parent, or it's children's ministry, and if you're a parent of a young child, then you'll have to suffice them and just tell them uh, patience and waiting will be rewarded, okay? Just one more week and they can have their annual light the night. And we appreciate your involvement with that as well. But today our hearts are focused on worship. Brother Don has a good message for us and I pray that you'll be praying for him and that God's spirit will work wonders in our midst today. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you for all you do for us. You are a great and a glorious God. And Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Father, for each aspect of this worship service today, Lord, that our hearts would be united in you. And Lord, you would just ignite our hearts just to love you and to long for you in a deeper way through this time of corporate worship. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Continue to sing about that name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. There is a truth. There is a truth.
there's none like him. The psalmist said, the Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. What a friend we have in Jesus.
sing, sing it with us. Thank you. have your Bibles today, I invite you to turn to Philippians chapter 4, and we'll read verses 4 through 7 as we continue our series on the great promises of God's Word. And today we're going to talk about the fact that you and I can live in the peace of God. We can have the peace that passes all understanding, regardless of what goes on around us, Within us, God dwells, and if we abide in him and he in us, then the peace of God can be ours. Chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. A few weeks ago, while looking through a secular magazine, there was an interesting article on anxiety, on worry, and it listed seven or eight things that we Americans worry about the most. Weight came in number one. I don't weigh enough. Oh my, I weigh way too much. Family security and protection was number two. Job security was number three. Will it last? Will I get that position that I'm looking for? Credit card debt fell right in there. Not only that, but growing old and having a lack of savings 
That too was an issue. In other words, we are anxious about our health and our finances. Those seem to be not just American issues, but universal issues around the world. Health and finances are reasons why people are anxious and why they worry. But it ought not to be so in the life of a child of God. In fact, Paul to the church at Philippi expresses this very thing. The Lord is present. The Lord is at hand. So don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to the Lord. Why is it that anxiety and worry are not right for the child of God? Well, Perhaps the most important is this. Without faith, it's impossible to please the Lord. So worry and anxiety is an absence of faith. That must mean that God is displeased when we are full of anxiety. Anxiety and worry are actually a sin. It is, and it may seem difficult to understand, it's a sin of adultery and of idolatry, of loving the wrong thing and of worshiping the wrong thing. It's a sin of placing somebody or something between you and a right relationship to God. It, it displeases God. But it also distracts us. You and I have a purpose. We have a plan that God gave to us. We have a potential that God invested within us. There are in the room this morning a number of people that if I challenged you to a race around the building, you would beat me without any difficulty. But what if I changed the rules? What if I put a heavy overcoat on you and filled all the pockets with lead? What if I gave you two very heavy suitcases to carry? And what if I tied your feet together? <laughs> At least I would have a chance. <laughs> Do you not realize that that's what anxiety does to you? It ties you up. It weights you down. It distracts you from the things that are rightfully yours as a child of God. No wonder the writer of the Hebrew epistle said, we're encompassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses. So let's lay aside the weight that so easily drags us down and the sin that grabs hold and will not let go. And let's run with patience the race that has been set before us keeping our eyes on Jesus who endured the cross. You see, anxiety displeases God because it's a form of worship that does not include Him. And it distracts us and even at times can destroy us because we're weighted down with the cares of this world. In fact, a good definition of anxiety and worry is excessive concern over the affairs of life. Constantly being obsessed by what's going on around us instead of by who indwells us. So in the passage that I've read in your hearing, there are a couple of thoughts that I'd like to share. The first is a prohibition. It's actually a thou shalt not. It's a command in the negative. Rejoice in the Lord, that's positive. The Lord is at hand, that's positive. But do not, thou shalt not be anxious about anything. I think it would be easy for you to say, well, the writer, he didn't know what I'm going through. But you do understand where he was and what he was going through. This is none other than Paul the Apostle. He's in a Roman jail, and every time he hears footsteps, he is uncertain whether or not that's a guard that's coming down the hallway to drag him out of his cage and behead him or stone him or burn him at the stake or crucify him upside down. 
the Apostle Paul is in a deep and dark and damp dungeon, never to get out in his mind, to be here for the rest of his life. And yet here is the man who has said, I have learned to be content wherever I find myself. What's the secret of that? Well, it's for me to live as Christ and then to die as gain. So I am not anxious about my circumstances. I'm not worried about my whereabouts. I am where God has placed me, and I trust him. So the writer, the circumstances of the writer indicates the importance of the passage. But there's another reason. Anxiety is a cloud that hovers over your head that hides the sun. Oh, I don't mean the S-U-N like on a cloudy day. I mean the S-O-N, the joy of the Lord. Anxiety robs you of the joy that God can give you. In fact, there is joy aplenty, joy enough. Joy is sufficient for every child of God to be filled to the fullness with the joy of the Lord. And yet when our circumstances take our mind, our situation takes our energy, we lose the joy of the Lord. The answer to that is 1 John 1, 9, confess your sin. He is faithful and just to forgive your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. If you understand that anxiety is indeed a sin, if worry is indeed putting something or somebody between you and the Lord and you confess that, then joy comes back. But joy cannot live in the mind and in the heart of a worried and anxious person. Not only robs you of joy, listen, this really drives a nail home in my opinion. If you're a constant worrier, if you're filled with anxiety, that reveals a whole lot of what you actually believe. See, if you really trust God, if you're convinced that his purpose and plan is right, if you know that he has a will for you and you're attempting to follow that will, if you believe that your God is a sovereign God, that he makes no mistakes, that you are who you are and where you are by his divine purpose and plan, if that's what you believe, you cannot constantly be occupied with anxiety and worry. There has to be a breakthrough. There has to come a time when you say, though this looks difficult, though this looks dangerous, though this is distracting to me, I lift my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. We have just sung together, turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wondrous face and the things of this earth that you worry about, that you're anxious over, the things of this earth all vanish in the light of his glory and grace. Worry is a conversation that you have with yourself when there's nothing you can do about it. Trust is a conversation you have with God when he can do anything that needs to be done. A prohibition. Whatever you do, don't be anxious. Then he addresses a precept, and he uses several words in this next verse when he says, In everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Prayer. Prayer is to the spiritual life what breathing is is to the physical life. If things are right in my body, I don't have to convince myself to breathe. I just exhale and inhale and exhale and inhale. It's a normal product that my lungs perform if my body is well. Isn't it strange 
that we have to commit ourselves, dedicate ourselves, remember to, find a time to get rid of something so we can have time to pray? Should prayer not be to our spiritual life the same thing that breathing is to our physical? Should I not awaken in the morning and take a deep spiritual breath and exhale the praises of the Lord? Should I not at any time during the day when difficulty comes, when problems arise, when circumstances are altered, should I not look at those in the light of the fact that he abides in me? And should I not take a deep breath and say, Oh God, I am now anxious to see how you will handle this set of circumstances. And I stand in the wings in awe of who you are knowing you're able and knowing that by your power you can and I breathe out his praises as I inhale his presence and breathe out his praises more of his presence is made available so that more of his praises can flow the second word is not just the word prayer there's the word petition you know what a petition is. Maybe some of you in years past have signed a document that stated how you felt about something or what your desire or your request was. So what God says to us is bring what you desire. Bring before me a request. The Bible says that when Jesus died on the cross, the veil in the temple was rent from top to bottom, opening wide the way to the mercy seat and to the holy of holies. As a child of God, you have access to the very presence of God. In fact, the book of Hebrews says, come boldly to the throne of grace and let your request, your petition be known. You and I have a right to, to state to God what we desire. Now listen, not every time will my desire be his. And when I find that to be true, I always ought to desire his will and not mine. But every child of God can come and say, Father, Daddy, here is my presentation. Here is my petition. Here is the desire of my heart. And the psalmist tells us that the desires of our heart can be fulfilled when we are in accordance with the will of God. When Bartimaeus, blind Bartimaeus, stood by the roadside begging and heard that Jesus was coming and Jesus walked up to him, it was a strange conversation in my opinion. Jesus said to blind Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? I would have been surprised if Bartimaeus had have said anything but that I might receive my sight. What else does a blind man need but sight restored? And so he said that I might see. And Jesus touched his eyes and he was able. You know your deepest want. You know your deepest desire. More than that, you know your deepest need. Petition the Father. In the model prayer, we're told to pray for daily bread. We're told to pray for His presence and His power to help us to overcome. Petition the Father. Special request. The word thanksgiving is used. You recognize that in just a few days it will be thanksgiving. We Americans have set aside a day that once a year we all come together and we give thanks. But for the Christian it's not a once a day, once a year. It's an every day and every moment of every day that we realize that we have a good, good God. That our Father is a blessing to us that our Savior is a strength to us, that our spirit that is within us is a guide and motivator for us. And every day we give gratitude and thanksgiving to the Lord. You know that in the same mind, gratitude and anxiety don't exist. You know that in the same life, worry and thankfulness don't get along. One must be cast out that the other might have freedom. 
The last word in that verse is the word request. Let your request come into the presence of God. You know, there's no detail too small. In fact, here's the truth. If you and I would learn to pray about the little stuff, maybe it wouldn't become the big stuff. Maybe if we prayed about every little thing, we would not be so overwhelmed and have to pray about the big things. Maybe if we took it all to the Lord and left it there, we could discover that we don't have to carry that burden, that difficulty, that situation. There's an old song. It's theologically sound, but it's easy to remember. The whole first verse is simply like this. Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want. I don't know if you've ever heard that or not. But if you don't know the second part, it's Jesus on the main line. Tell him what you want. And in the true spirit of courses, it says next, Jesus on the main line. Tell him what you want. Tell him. Tell him what you want. Well, I don't mean to take the side of me demanding of God his obligation to me. I do mean to take the side of being honest in the presence of the Lord. I do mean to take the side of being specific in the presence of the Lord. We are too prone to pray, Lord, save the lost. Lord, bless the missionaries. Surely you know somebody that's lost that you can call out his or her name. Surely you know some missionary, some pastor some Christian worker that you can name them specifically. Jesus is on the main line. My brother, my sister, my mother, my father, my son, my daughter, my friend, they're lost, and I'm praying for them. Jesus is on the main line. Lord, here's a circumstance that if you don't intervene, it won't be right. It won't get fixed. It's going to be an issue. Jesus is on the main line. That's who he is. Tell him what you want. That's who we are. So there's this request. Finally, there's the promise. When you pray like that, trust like that, and believe like that, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So that verse gives me the source of peace. It's the peace of God. You don't get any peace by just talking it over with somebody else. This positive thinking is okay so far. But it's not what it takes to get past the difficulties of life. It's not a little train on the way up the hill who says, I think I can, I think I can. It's a Christian climbing the hills of life who says, I know he can, I know he can, I know that he can. The source of peace is not within. I'm not at peace. You're not at peace, but the peace of God that passes all understanding can and will dwell inside of you. And it's not just the source. He mentions the size of what he offers to me. How much of God's peace can I have? How big is the peace of God? Why, it's so big that it surpasses all of our understandings. If every person in the room were to reason about the peace of God, it would be beyond that. 
It's a surplus. It's like the feeding of the 5,000. When they got through, they had more than they started with. It's, it's that in my life and yours. When I begin to trust God and he gives me the peace of God, I end up with more peace than I can possibly imagine. God's peace is sufficient. God's peace is efficient. God's peace in my heart makes life worth living and makes things right. But it's not just the source nor the size. There's one other thing. It's the security of that peace. The word guard in the original language is a garrison. It's a fortress. And that's exactly what happens. When I commit my heart to the Lord, when I commit my mind to the Lord, when I think on the things of God, when I ask for the peace of God, He builds a fortress around me. It may be built out of angels. I don't know. But I do know one thing. At every guard station, He posts someone who has my best interest in mind. Because I know that all things that are about to happen to me happen for his glory and for my good. He guards me. And I don't know if you know this, but no one can break through the guardianship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 8 says nothing. And then mentions 17 things and finishes by saying nor any other. God says, nothing separates you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus the Lord. He'll build a fortress around you. He's in there, and nobody that wants to harm you can get in there. And that's how you can live in the peace of God. Because God said, you can live in me, and I will live in in you. As a child, we sung the old hymn that I'll give you as a poem and then we'll be through. If the world from you withholds all its silver and its gold, and you have to get along with meager fare, just remember in his word how he feeds the little birds. Take your burden to the Lord. And leave it there. Leave it there. Leave it there. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. If you trust and never doubt, He will surely bring you out. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Amen. Father, thank you for the time that we have had together in your word. In this building today and online, if there are any who are struggling, who are having difficulty trusting, who are fighting an impossible battle to win, I pray that you would overwhelm them and us with the presence and power of your Spirit, convincing us that if we simply bring our burdens to you, you will lift them and give us the peace that passes all understanding. Anyone in this room today who is unsaved, I pray that they would be convicted of their sin and cry out to Jesus for salvation. Anyone who needs to become a part of our church family, I pray they'd have the strength to do that today. Anyone who needs to lay it down, whatever it is, anyone who needs to lay it down at the place of prayer, May this be the morning when that takes place. And when we have left this room, may we leave with the peace that passes all understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. Hello, my name is Michael Tree, the college and young adult pastor here at Central. And I want to thank you so much for joining us online. At Central Baptist Church, we want to make sure this never replaces your commitment to a local body of believers. A local church is the primary means God uses to minister to people. If you're in the Conway area, I am personally inviting you to Central the next time we meet. Now it's time to take what we have studied and apply it throughout our week. 
Thanks for worshiping with us today at Central.